Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Anne-Marie Morse. There's an official bio and there's an unofficial one. Just kidding, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, our sound um, isn't working this morning because she was going to actually sing for us. <laughs> um, the challenge is still there, Anne-Marie, but the I should really just stay serious. Okay, Dr. Morse is a board-certified and fellowship-trained pediatric neurologist. She is the Director of Child Neurology and Pediatric Sleep Medicine at Gasinger Medical Center. She's also an Associate Professor at the Gasinger School of Medicine, and her clinical and research interests include sleep-wake disorders in neurological sleep, hypersomnia disorders, and sleep-wake disorder phenotyping. Dr. Morse created the Wake Up and Learn Clinical Program, which is a school-based sleep education and screening program to help improve sleep culture and optimize daytime performance. This program is primarily designed for elementary through college students. And she was also recently uh, appointed to the board of directors at the Sleep Research Society Foundation. I should add that Dr. Morse is um, really occupies as a kind of pioneer, really interesting space between um, her work as a clinician and a researcher, and also as a advocate uh, for people with sleep disorders and their supporters. And she's extremely effective on social media. That's probably where you recognize her. And um, so do also follow Dr. Morse at Damn Good Sleep. That's D-A-M-M, -M, Dr. Amory Morse, at Damn Good Sleep on all social media platforms, pretty much mm -hmm. all of them, right? Yeah. So welcome, thank you. thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think we can do better than that. I know we're sleepy, but I think we can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Awesome. Well, I want a nice, energized room because what I'm going to talk about today is how do we actually optimize the experience that you have every day? So the reason I entitled this Live, Love, Laugh Without Limits is because most frequently when I encounter individuals who have a central disorder of hypersomnolence, they tell me that there's one of those that they're not doing. And many times, none of those are they doing at full capacity. And so what I am here to do today is challenge you to begin your best life. Many times when we are diagnosed with any medical condition, we start to define ourselves by that condition. Very frequently I hear people tell me, I'm the narcoleptic patient, I'm the hypersomnia patient, I'm the difficult patient. You are none of those things. You are not defined by the condition you are on a medical journey with. You may be a mother, you may be a father, you may be a brother, you may be an employee of XYZ company. You may be a huge Eagles fan or a Phillies fan, but you are not defined by a disease. When you do that, you put a glass ceiling on yourself of what you're able to accomplish. You adopt a victim mentality where things are being done onto you versus you being able to exercise what you actually have control over and what you can influence. So I borrowed these graphics that I've read from um, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He frequently describes that people tend in difficult situations to focus on the things that they feel like are being done to them. When you get diagnosed with something that changes your entire life's focus, changes your entire life's trajectory, that now becomes something that you feel like is out of your control. The reality is that when you have your circle of concern, your medical diagnosis, overriding what you feel like you can actually change, you then become just that diagnosis and nothing else. So what does this look like? What actually do you have control over? This gives you an illustration of some of the things that you can do. So you may not be able to control all these things all over the world. You can't control what other people are posting on social media. You can't control how other people view you. But what you can control 
is what you're going to put out into the world, what you're going to exercise on a daily basis. What you can control is the narrative of what does hypersomnolence look like? What does successful treatment look like? What do my goals look like? So I very, very frequently describe the fact that people with chronic medical conditions, like a central disorder of hypersomnolence, are in a medical journey. The reason I say this is because it is not a fixed position. Where you are today in your medical journey is purely one isolated spot. You're going to expect change over time. And that is a frightening thing to hear because you go, I'm in a good place, I don't want change. Or maybe you're saying, thank God, this is fucking horrible. <laughs> I hope there's change. The reality is that change is the only constant we have in our lives. And if you don't expect it, you will constantly be disappointed. If you do expect it, you can always be prepared. When you talk about this medical journey, this may be reflective of some point that some of you may be in. There was a period of time where maybe you had no central disorder of hypersomnolence. Some of you may recall that period and miss that period, and some of you may not. Maybe something that affected you at such a young age that you know nothing different. There then is this very, very difficult part of the journey where there's the symptom onset, you start seeking care, the average person who has a central disorder of hypersomnolence sees three to five providers, acquiring three to five potentially misdiagnoses, potentially true diagnoses, but just comorbid. And what do we start to do? We start to define ourselves and our experiences by those things, limiting ourselves, putting barriers as to what great can look like. Along that journey, we finally get that diagnosis. It's that eureka moment. Finally, I have a name to put it to. Unfortunately, when we put that name there, that then be begins the grieving process. The sorrow for what could have been, what I missed out on, what my life used to look like. The anger, the denial, the frustration. And then sometimes we get to the point of acceptance. We then are, enter into this period of treatment. This is where many times we again feel reinforced that we're defined by our diagnosis because we feel vulnerable to the fact that I need a medication to quote unquote be normal. I would encourage you to abandon the mindset that you're on a journey to being normal. My normal is not the same as your normal, not the same as your normal, not the same as your normal. The reality is normal is a falsehood. What we're looking at are tangible, meetable goals in order to incrementally achieve the things that make a difference to us. When we look at this journey, there not only is that journey of going through the diagnostic odyssey, but it's important to recognize when we're talking about this journey and the expectation of change, that it's not just that diseases change or medications change, Life expectations change. When I was five years old, my expectations and what quote unquote normal is, is different from the 10 year old, to the 15 year old, to the 20 year old, to the 40 year old. What changes are social expectations, things that are going to be additional burdens onto us. The reason I illustrate this point is because it's not uncommon that you may see someone who at 15 years of age was diagnosed, gets treatment, went from failing in school, to going back to getting good grades, they graduate high school, they get to college. Now mom and dad aren't making dinner anymore, or doing grocery shopping. They're living on their own. They're responsible for their own laundry. Their disease hasn't changed, their medication hasn't changed. Their expectations of what great looks like changed and you need to respond to that. And the reason that's an empowering mindset is because you feel disabled. 
when you think that your drugs are failing you, when you think your treatment is failing you, when you go back to your doctor and say, I'm not as well, but you don't know how to name it or point out what is it that is different for me. So we talk about the journey, right? The roadmap, where we need to go. How many of you use a GPS or Google Maps or Apple iPhone Maps? Every single person in this room, right? You need your GPS, not to tell you where to go, but to give you options on how to get to your destination. That's your HCP. Your HCP, what is that? Is that your healthcare professional? Your healthcare provider? I think these are terms that should be abandoned. They should be your healthcare partner. We are here to partner with you to give options in how to get to the destination that you've chosen. Healthcare fails you when you come into the office and there is someone who tells you what your destination should be, tells you how you're going to measure your success. For any patient who has seen me, I have my first visit with you, I get to spend an hour, hour and a half with you. I know you for an hour to an hour and a half. I know nothing about your life. Even though I've taken a detailed history, I know nothing about what is going to be your optimal. I know nothing about what you're experiencing once you leave those doors. That is all you. So characteristics to consider when choosing your GPS is whether they have 5G compatibility, Wi-Fi, no. Do not, you do not need the expert. You do not need the person who says, I have 300 patients who have this condition. Although that seems to be an attractive trait, right? You would say, well, I want them to know everything about it. You want the person who wants to know everything about you and is willing to listen. Hear what you have to say. Consider what are your concerns? What options do you want to pursue? What are things that they actually don't know? Ask you questions. Ask you for your input. Ask you what you think. Respond. Respond to your concerns while you're there. Respond to you when you're not in the visit. The reality is healthcare is designed to be episodic delivery of care. I see you today, I see you in three months, I see you in six months. Does your life exist outside of those appointments? However, we set it up in a failed way so that we don't acknowledge those points in between. And so being able to have them accessible where they can respond. Someone who encourages you. Encourages you to look at, are you the best version of you? If you are measured purely by an upward sleepiness scale that has gone from a 16 to a nine or a 10, and we don't want to push anymore. We don't want to rock the boat. But you're still not thriving. You're just surviving. That is not optimal management. And then finally, someone who, there shouldn't be three Ps, but supports you. They're really supportive. <laughs> so enter your destination. You have a journey. You have your map. You have your GPS. Enter your destination. Which one do you want to take? How many of you feel like you're on the top line? How many of you feel like you're on the bottom? The majority of us. That doesn't seem like the most direct route to get to where we want to be. So how do you know what your destination is? Many of us rely on our doctor to tell us what our destination is. They tell us your sleepiness is better because your Epler says so, right? And I always tell people, I have yet to have someone come in and say, hi, I'm here, I'm a 17. Can you help me? Doc, I'm doing so great, I'm a five. 
Um, you are the only source of truth. I frequently tell people, my expertise is in diseases, diagnostic tests, and medicine. My patient's expertise is in their life. And therefore, when we work together, I need to rely on them to tell me where we need to go and how we're going to get there. And so with that stated, this allows for you, you should use a symptom diary, not just a sleep diary, a symptom diary. Why? Do, does a central disorder of hypersomnolence, does it affect your day? But frequently when you go to a sleep doctor, what do we want to talk about? Your night. We neglect all the areas of the day. The rest of the medicine, they just want to talk about the day. They don't want to talk about your night. But this allows for you and your healthcare partner, I want everyone in here to start using that term, partner, to identify trends and patterns. It provides personal insights for you on what you can influence or control. Remember, using that circle of influence. It can also help you to establish a diagnosis. Maybe there are some of you who have not yet been diagnosed. You're still on that diagnostic pathway. And by doing this symptom journaling or diary, it may provide the right information for someone to finally have that eureka moment for you. It also helps you establish a baseline. How do you know if you're getting better if you don't know where you're at now? It also helps you reduce feelings of vulnerability. When I know where I am and I know how to monitor my progress and I know when to pull the oh boy lever, it allows for me to respond to changes as they come without me having to hit the wall and crash and feel like everything has fallen apart. So the reason I state this is because when studied, and this was a study um, that actually um, Jazz Pharmaceuticals had supported, looking at the impact in idiopathic hypersomnia um, and narcolepsy. And so with this stated, this was looking at individuals and asking them, what was the impact of narcolepsy on your daily life? Most people are saying there's a significant impact. In this study, the ARISE study, there was an evaluation for patients with idiopathic hypersomnia and looking at quality of life scales. And as you can see, all having very, very significant impairment in their quality of life. When looking at stigma, associated with it. So quality of life being compromised by stigma. We see the same thing, that there's a significant impairment there. How many of you, when you've gone to your doctor, have been asked about stigma or quality of life? So I thought. There was then another study that was done that was looking at narcolepsy and an impact on social life. Does it make it harder? Do you have friends? How much time are you spending time with them? What trend do you see here? You see that it makes having these conditions make it hard. It make it hard to maintain friends because I don't ever see them, because I don't have the capacity to do so. How many times have your doctors asked you, do you have friends? Do you see your friends? What do you do with your friends? We don't. We don't ask those questions. This was from a, a great study that was done um, looking, asking adolescents and their parents, who um, in this particular study by uh, Karen Maskey and, and her group, what is the impact? And they did a qualitative assessment. When my narcolepsy was at its worst, I'd say, and I couldn't function very well, I didn't really have my best friend anymore. And like, I wasn't as close to people, and I kind of lost all my confidence. I've heard him say things like, I don't have any friends, or I only have one friend, and I think he wishes he could have more friends and that people liked him more, like more likable. He doesn't believe that he's likable, but I also know that he just believes that he's completely different. He has narcolepsy. People look at him differently. He feels pretty strongly about that. With having narcolepsy, it gives my mood a boost in a bad way, I guess. 
So in the morning's my show. So in the morning, I'll be sort of moody towards my parents and my brothers just because I just woke up and I really want to wake up. She struggles a lot with anxiety and depression. Truthfully, at the beginning, when it was undiagnosed, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle the pressure of being the person that she was always crying with. She'd get that look on her face, and then she would tell me how bad her life was. It really just, it lowers my, I guess, willingness to do those things when usually I would love to do them. I really can't play basketball for long periods of time without needing a nap, and sometimes that can get in the way. By a raise of hands, how many of these comments can you identify with as either a person who has a central disorder of hypersomnolence or a family member who has, a central dis who has um, someone with a central disorder of hypersomnolence? How many times has your doctor asked you questions about any of these things? How many times have you brought it to their attention? How many times have you felt that that wasn't their job to manage these things? The reality is, is that this is one of the things that contribute to the burden of this condition, is that these things are happening on a daily basis, yet there's a failure of communication between the healthcare partner and the patient, because we're not asking the questions and we're not hearing the problem. And this is all a part of that symptom diary that you can be collecting to be able to present in an organized manner to have a very effective communication about it. So how are these disabilities communicated? So this was done, this is a study um, pulled from uh, Tom Scammell and he had looked at adults um, with narcolepsy and wanted to kind of see what were the problems that were occurring and how frequently were people being asked about these things? And so in this study, they focused a lot on uh, relationships. Some of the things they identified were that individuals who had narcolepsy had half of the marriage rates. They um, had very, very compromised sexual intimacy um, relationships. And they wanted to understand what is it that the patients were experiencing. So has your doctor asked about your social life? About 70% said no. Has your doctor asked you about your sex life? 90% said no. Do you want your doctor to ask you about your social life? The majority said yes. Do you want your doctor, do you want your doctor to ask you about your sex life? It's kind of on the fence, about 50% said yes, right? Now, the reality is, is that although it can be an uncomfortable part of the conversation, the reality is, is that if your doctor's not asking you and you're feeling in a, a compromised experience, who's giving you those solutions? How are we going to get that better? So one of my favorite authors is Cy Wakeman. She um, is an incredible author and she's a, an incredible leadership expert. And um, one of her books, Reality Based Leadership, that I had read, um, I remember I initially read this and I was like, who the hell says this? Me. Apparently me. Um, she would give examples of that. You would have the, the person who's coming to you and complaining and da 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 And she goes, and so my response will be, well, what does great look like? And so I, I, when I had heard it, it made me chuckle so much because I'm like, I can't even imagine if I were to say this to one of my staff when they came to complain to me about what so-and-so did, et cetera. And then one day I just did it because I was just like, I don't have time for this. And I said, well, what would great look like? And they just stopped and they're like, um, I guess I could, and they all of a sudden found a solution, right? And they all of a sudden went and were able to take care of it themselves. So I very frequently use this mentality myself, even when I start doing that negative talk in my own head. It helps me to break that. What does great look like? So this is a study um, that um, Avidal had done, and um, uh, this was doing some surveys to be get a better sense in regards to what are the, some of the symptom burdens that people are experiencing. And so again, when I talk to patients very frequently, how am I qualifying um, uh, their experience with excessive daytime sleepiness? How many hours are you sleeping? Are you napping? Do you feel tired? Upward sleepiness scale, et cetera. But the reality is, is that 
These are the things that matter, and it actually isn't quantified or qualified in a way we're typically asking. Are you being productive? What is your sense of well-being? What are your energy levels? What is your cognition, brain fog symptoms? What is your quality of sleep? Are there any other things that may be going on? And so they give a whole listing over here. So what are your steps to developing your progress map, okay? So we've talked about the journey map, we've talked about your GPS, we've talked about your symptom diary, right? Now we need to have that progress map in order to know, are we actually on the right track? Did your GPS help you choose the right path to get there? So from your symptom diary, what are your symptoms that you identified? What is disrupted for you? How are these symptoms impacting your life? What is the pattern of that disruption? Is it the same day to day? Does it fluctuate? Are there other factors that you feel are out of your control but you have influence on? What other wellness concerns are present? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have obesity? Do you have hormone issues? Is, do you have dysfunctional uterine bleeding? Are you trying to get pregnant? What is it else that you, we need to think about? And then what does great look like? What routes are available? What is the expected time to destination? What are possible detours that may occur? When should I reroute? When do I abandon this path? And we consider a different option. And how often should I press that on start button to be able to get that emergency, that SOS? So I'm going to give you an illustration using a case. This is a completely made up case, so I don't have to worry about HIPAA. So Jennifer is a 10-year-old girl with a new diagnosis of a central disorder of hypersomnolence. She sleeps nine hours per night and naps four times a day for 40 to 60 minutes at a time. She is struggling with attendance in school and successfully completing schoolwork. She has missed 30 days of school in the last six months. Grades are a C average, previously an AB student. She was once a bubbly, outgoing, gregarious child. She's now quiet and tends to spend most of her time alone. Alternatively, she can be very irritable and oppositional. She doesn't want to have play dates. There's been weight gain, once 25th percentile, now 85th percentile with any significant height change. And when asleep, she's very restless and frequently complains of nightmares the following day or goes to her parents' room to sleep. What does great look like for this? What would normally get treated here? Excessive daytime sleepiness. I'm going to go back to this slide. What, what should we be treating? What symptoms there do you think are burdensome? You can call them out. What do you think is burdensome for this kid or this family? Naps four times a day for 40 to 60 minutes at a time. Time is a critical element in my life. I'm losing out on it. What else? Nightmares. Nightmares. Think that might bother her? Think of my father, the parents, that she keeps coming in their bed, right? Bothering the whole family unit. What else? Yeah, change in personality. As a parent, I've lost a child that I know. As the kiddo, I'm self-isolated, marginalized. You better bet I'm going to be calling her depression, right? What else is there? Missing school. Compromised opportunity for socialization. Compromised opportunity for academic success. And this is all just one point in time. What does this look like in six months, six years, 60 years? So in this progress map, things that we want to look at are how do we reduce the frequency or duration of naps? How do we improve nightmares? How do we get her to sleep in her own bed? Improve her restlessness when she's sleeping. Improve attendance, improve grades, improve socialization, improve mood stability, weight management, adjustment to diagnosis, coping skills. What about the family? If I were to give her a medication today, do I expect that she's better tomorrow? What does better look like? No. So we need to develop a progress map to know that we're going in the right direction, because no matter how great a drug is, it is not going to be a cure, and I'm not going to flip you to quote unquote normal tomorrow. And so therefore, we need to be able to say, what is it that we're treating? And by me saying I'm treating sleepiness, it's bullshit. That's the reality. 
is that what I'm treating is a person who is suffering from symptoms that are impacting all areas of life, and therefore, we need to partner to understand how do I get those symptoms better. So approaches to consider. Stop just saying medications are going to treat everything. They're not. The lie. For the napping and restlessness, we're going to do sleep scheduling. We're going to look at some behavioral influences. What else can we do to see what's causing the napping? Is it just that it's the timing of the day? Is it what she's eating? Is it the activity she's engaged in? Evaluating for other sleep disorders. Why is she so restless? Does she have restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement? Does she have OSI? And are medications appropriate? School attendance and performance. Educate the school. Make sure they know what this condition is, why she's struggling. Have her evaluated for a 504 plan or an IEP. Have an OT evaluation to see if there are specific accommodations in school that will help her to be um, more um, optimal in her performance. Nightmares, getting to sleep on her own, psychology support, sleep hygiene, weight management, nutrition referral, exercise, consider endocrinology. Is there are other things that we need to do. Mood stability and coping, psychology support, medications, social support, and then a family also for their own psychology and social support. What can progress look like? She sleeps nine hours per night, still napping four times a day, but they're 20 minutes at a time. That sometimes cannot feel like progress because if I just quantify how many naps, I'm still napping four times a day. But how much time did I give back? So it's still progress. We're not at great, but we're doing better. Rare nightmares and always sleeping in her own bed, just with some psychology support. She has a 504 pan. She has missed 10 days of school in the last six months. Grades are mostly A's and B's with a rare C. So we're not quite back to where we were, but we're making progress. She's participating in dance classes, has play dates at least once a week, and even has needed redirection by her teacher for talking to her friends during class. How many times would we be so happy that our kids are getting in trouble in school? Weight is 75th percentile. She's learned to avoid heavy carb lunches due to sleepiness afterwards, and it also reduces calorie burden. So your call to action today, remember what my challenge was for you, Exercise your circle of influence. Don't fear change. Expect change and be prepared. Characterize your current state using a symptom diary. Define what great looks like you, for you now. Partner with your healthcare partner, remember we're going to use that new term, to create your personalized progress map. And last but not least, don't accept less. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Um, we have some uh, opportunity now for questions in the room and also keep an eye on those who are joining us virtually. Please put your questions in the chat. Um, who would like to ask Dr. Morse question? <laughs> you go to the Hypersomnia Foundations, find a provider. <laughs> well, what I, what I would say to you is that um, uh, sometimes it is a matter of, one, seeing what other people are identifying in your community. Um, so I do think that with all the advocacy organizations, Hypersomnia Foundation obviously being one of them, um, uh, we do find that there's pockets of communities in certain zip codes. Um, and very frequently, when they're active on social media, they're able to kind of give that information of who I'm finding is responding. The other piece that I always encourage patients is that if you're working with a provider who maybe that's the only thing you have, by being equipped with your information that you want acknowledged, you can sometimes force change behaviors in the people you're seeing. Now, that's not one size fits all, right? That's not one, I totally understand that. I'm in medicine, I get it. But the reality is, is that I would say most people who are in medicine went into medicine with the right reasons in mind, that they actually wanted to help people. And very frequently what I encounter is when, when doctors, especially, don't know the right answer, that they become more defensive. 
because we're trained to never be wrong, right? It's a very, very um, uh, poor setup. And so many times this is where I think it is helpful for there to be kind of even a suggestion. And I always tell people who have rare disease, you guys are much more experts than the majority of doctors that you're ever going to see. Um, and so I generally would say to continue to kind of um, encourage those relationships and redirect the conversation to the things that you actually care about. Um, and then if that fails, yeah, you need to abandon them and find someone else. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So is that in between time when you're um, like between visits? Yes. Like when you need help with something, do you have any tips for what patients can do to get a response when they're not getting one? Sure. So it depends on what it is that you're asking, right? So very frequently, I think that the part that becomes a challenge of when there's a slow or no response is that there is not a very specific or very like direct, this is the question I want answered, right? And so that's the reason why I, I really encourage this idea about that in between that symptom mapping of this is what has changed for me. I'm on X drug, I'm doing X strategy, this is where I was, this is where I am now, what should I do to respond to this exact thing? And so there sometimes are the challenges that when it's coming in through the phone calls, <laughs> that can sometimes be a little bit more obscured by whoever's taking the message. But if there's a portal and you're able to actually kind of outline those things, it becomes very direct and now you're getting the answer that you actually want. Um, but I do also recognize that one of the big limit limiting factors right now is, is that many, practices are so overwhelmed that it takes them a very long time to respond to things. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. You had mentioned the, um, I, I, my fried brain, the tracking your symptoms, the symptom track, tracker. Is there, how do you know the difference between a symptom and just your everyday living. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and sure. probably 90% of what symptoms are, I wouldn't even consider symptoms anymore because it's part of my life. Is there some sort of um, reference guide <laughs> like yeah. to kind of so, get so us along on that? You make such a great point of that. This is why many times the things that would be better for you are not are being missed. So when you just described that everything that you're experiencing is a part of your everyday life. What I would encourage you to look at is saying, what isn't as good as I would want it to be? That's the symptom you should be managing, right? So if you're describing that my everyday life, I struggle, and I'm just gonna make things up, I struggle with being able to work more than four hours in a day and doing the laundry. That would be, I would say, okay, well then, is that true every day? Can you not do more than four hours and can you not do laundry? If we then say we're going to in institute a treatment, do we see that now you're able to do five hours of work and the laundry, right? Um, and so I, obviously that's just like a very obscure and obviously most people have more things that they wanna accomplish. But the reason I state that is because you're not gonna go from working part-time to now working full-time with one treatment. But if I'm able to say, okay, I'm working, and then I also am socializing, and I'm able to start adding in the things that are important to me, that allows for there to be more of a foundation and building versus what typically happens, which is I started you on a treatment, medication, behavioral, right? I come back and I say, I'm still not as good as what I want. And typically what happens is, well, let's take this drug away and give you this new drug. So what ends up occurring for the patient is the yo-yo. I took this many steps and I go back this way. And what ends up happening when that happens so many times is the patient becomes conditioned to accepting a lesser form of life because they're afraid of having things taken away versus being able to say, let me quantify the positive change I've experienced because of this. I'm not experiencing side effects. I am experiencing benefit. It's just not the benefit to the degree that I would like it to be. And therefore, we need to do something additive 
Instead, we do a lot of the subtraction and add, subtraction and add. So that's where that progress map and understanding what it is that better looks like and what great would look like allows you to inform your doctor on what to do, right? Does that make sense? Individualized thing. It's not like a list of symptoms. It's exactly your life. And exactly. So the symptoms may be excessive daytime sleepiness, sleep inertia, brain fog. However, when I say excessive daytime sleepiness, your experience with EDS is going to be different from your experience with EDS versus your experience with EDS. And so, therefore, when you come in and say, "I'm still sleepy," that doesn't make me be able to give you a more specific treatment strategy that actually is going to change the thing that you're measuring your sleepiness with, right? And so that's where it's going to be important to, to be able to say, OK, I am getting better, just the same as brain fog. I may have brain fog where I have word finding difficulties. You may have brain fog where you have processing difficulties. And then being able to say, how does that present for me? And is that improving? And how do I measure that improvement? Because it's not a switch. It's not an on or off. And then that also allows you to feel more in control over, OK, I see that. It's not an on or off. But I do see that I used to not be able to do this. And now I can do that. Any other questions? Um, hello. So I would like to. Um as how could you advocate for yourself in the workplace? That's a great because, question. Okay. That's a great question. So um, first and foremost, it is really important um, to know that these types of conditions are, are protected under the American with Disabilities Act. Um, and so therefore, it is appropriate for you to be able to partner with HR to understand what accommodations um, uh, may be um, able to be provided for you. Now, with that stated, I generally encourage for you to also partner with your healthcare partner um, to be able to review these are the different accommodations that I think are going to be helpful for me. Sometimes there is a period of, of evaluation. So I always try to avoid words like trial and error because that makes me feel like I have to fail things, right? It really is a matter of saying, what works for me? And so uh, accommodations that can potentially be available include um, flexible schedules. They can include um, work from home sometimes. A, they can include napping accommodations. They can include um, uh, potentially some variations on timelines for you to be able to do different work. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of things that could be considered. The other piece that is also important is that if you're if you're a person who um, uh, you know that you have severe sleep inertia and that you need to be able to have a later schedule, um, uh, that those are all the kind of accommodations that could potentially be afforded. You. You're welcome. Also, as, as well, um, uh, there could be um, the same type of OT accommodations that I had been describing for students could also be relevant for people at work. So for instance, um, having kind of those ergonomic evaluations, maybe instead of if you're doing desk work, I don't do a sitting desk. I do a standing desk. Or having one of those very desks so that if I do get tired, I can stand. Um, I have a treadmill, whatever it might be. Um, so those are all um, different options, sitting on one of the exercise ball type things so that it does core stability and helps engaging me. Um, those are all different. Uh, resources that also can be available. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes. It seems tra sometimes tracking, wow, um, sometimes tracking symptoms can seem overwhelming for someone who has this, to have to do that every day. Is there some easy way to, for them to go about it? Sure. So I would say that if there's a, a very specific thing that they are concerned about, um, and so maybe they just start with their one thing, because like you said, it can be very overwhelming. I would encourage them to create a Likert scale. Maybe it's a 1 to 10. A 1 is my worst, and a 10 is my best, right? And so again, going back to work. Maybe I'm not going to track hours of work. Maybe I'm going to think about it in terms of quality. And so I have work 1 to 10. Today was a three, tomorrow was a five, today was a two. And now you're able to look at that longitudinally so that this way it's, it's not as heavy to look at. Now, for some people, they may want to look at multiple spheres of life, socialization, work, academics, et cetera. 
others, that might be overwhelming to even consider that task. But being able to have whatever is your highest priority as a thing you can look at longitudinally um, is only going to help yourself. And if we can't even get you to the point where you're able to track symptoms, then we're really in a bad place just to start. Right, thank you very thank you. much. That's more.